So our next speaker, uh, I'm very excited to introduce to you. Um, long ago, in the, in, in, the, in the before times, Steve Blank used to uh, talk about how ideas from customer development were pretty good, used in a lot of situations, but certainly not if you're trying to, for example, he always used these two examples, uh, send a rocket to the moon or cure cancer. So when I started talking about Lean Startup, I would just borrow that same line from him, as I did with many things, uh, and would say, yeah, if you're trying to cure cancer, uh, you know, maybe this isn't for you. And we don't say that anymore. And you'll hear tomorrow about Steve's work with the NSF, where uh, we're doing that. And in this next talk, you're going to hear from someone who is actually trying to cure cancer. And what I think is so cool about the approach that they are taking at a company called Emerald Therapeutics is we talk a lot about how Lean Startup is most applicable in situations where you can combine fast cycle time, highly iterative development, with high uncertainty. Now, curing cancer certainly has that uncertainty. But we tend to tr view the cycle time of a business as something that's given by the industrial setting that we work in, rather than realizing that it's a choice that we make when we choose to devise our own tools. Uh, and rather than steal his thunder, let me bring up Brian Frezza from Ever Emerald Therapeutics. Hi. So I'm not going to talk about Emerald's research today, but I am going to talk a little bit about uh, what Eric just mentioned about uh, what it is to be lean in biotech, what that even means. It was actually baffling when I was asked to do this talk because biotech is pretty much the farthest from lean as you can get, and it's kind of headed in the opposite direction. Uh, but there's something that we've been doing uniquely, I'll talk about a little bit at the end, uh, to try to reverse that trend and do something about it. Okay, so let's, let's start by taking an example of a field that's extremely successful and then compare it to development and what it looks like in the biotech world. Uh, we're all familiar with Moore's Law, we're from Silicon Valley, and it speaks about transistor density on chips, but more generally we can think about it as exponential reduction in costs of the things in the semiconductor world. So we've seen processors, power, disk space, memory, bandwidth, all of these things we've seen exponentially dropping. And this is what true and absolute success looks like in, an, in a market ecosystem. <clears throat> so somebody had the foresight to do the same kind of analysis on the biotech world recently. Uh, and they were perhaps feeling a little morbid, and they decided to name uh, the trend in biotech Eroom's Law. And for those of you who haven't had your coffee yet, that's Moore's Law backwards. <laughs> the trend goes the other way. It's, in fact, exponential. It doubles roughly about every 11 years the cost it takes to develop one drug. And I'd love, as a Silicon Valley libertarian, to blame this on regulation. Uh, the data just simply doesn't support that. The only little dips you see here are things like in the late 1960s, regulations tighten a little bit post thalidomide. In the early 1990s, the first wave of biologics show up. But these only have local effects on the trend. They don't affect the overall global trend, which seems to be much larger and stronger than that. Now, you might look at this chart and say, why hasn't the biotech industry therefore collapsed under the weight of this? And the truth is that this ends up in the consumer's pocket. So if we look at the computer industry, spending is pretty much flat over a broad period of time. But we all know if we look at healthcare spending, it too is following an exponential trend. Um, and this, of course, is not an unlimited resource. We can't keep coming back to this internal, uh, eternally. But for now, it's been doing just fine to keep our profits pretty steady. So let's look a bit at where that cost is all coming from. The first is in just R&D expenditures per employee on an ongoing basis. So if you stack up the cost there, life sciences is the worst of the worst. It was actually shocking to see that this is several fold higher than even the aerospace industry. In fact, launching satellites, you spend less money on materials and experiments than you do in the life sciences. And it's not just the recurring burn. It happens too in the fixed costs. If you think about the cost of building a lab, if you're just going to build a single purpose lab that's doing one or two experiments that you know in advance what they are, that costs you somewhere between 500,000 and a million. If you're going to build a minimalist lab, which can do generally any experiment in a single category, say cell biology or organic chemistry, that would cost you something like one to three million. If you want a big lab that can really run any experiment you want, that's going to cost you north of 10 million. And that's pretty much reserved for the large universities and the biotech and pharmaceutical companies that have this kind of budget. Now, of course, all that money stacks up into startups as well. Startup financing in the biotech world looks drastically different than the tech world. In fact, the average first round financing of biotech looks more like the second, third, later rounds of the tech field. And this, of course, produces a huge barrier to entry for anyone who's going to go in and change things dramatically. OK, so these are just the numbers. Let's get into what the process of uh, drug innovation actually looks like uh, at an organizational level and see how that's changed, too, over time. 
to get more bureaucratic. So the way it works today is that in a modern laboratory, you have a principal investigator, or PI, who sits at the top of the research. The PI has working for him or her a series of scientists. And then if it's a well-supported organization, those scientists have working for them a series of research associates. The research associates then carry out the actual experiments on complex instrumentation, and they produce data. That data then gets passed back on to the scientists, who decide what's salient to pass back on to the PI. Now, this system is built out of the necessity of the PI to control such a large number of experiments. But the problem is it creates great difficulties in communication, both coming from and going to the PI. Essentially, these people at the bottom level making instrument decisions have to guess at the intentions of the higher level people and exactly what they wanted there. And the per person, the PI, the principal investigator, is seeing a much rosier picture than the data on the ground suggests, as they're only getting handed the best data from the previous levels. You want to give your boss whatever looks the best. It didn't used to be this way. If we take a step back for a second and we look all the way to 1928, Alexander Fleming was running a lab uh, searching for antibiotics. At the time, it was him and one research assistant. And what they did is they were plating a bunch of agar plates to grow bacteria on them, and they were subjecting them to a series of compounds to see if the drugs were retarding the growth of the bacteria. Now, Fleming was kind of sloppy, and he left the plate out overnight, and it got a fungal infection on it. And when he looked at the fungal infection, he noticed this really interesting pattern. The bacteria was dying in a big ring around where the fungus was, pretty far from it. Now, he was clever enough and had the insight to think carefully, well, what if the fungus was secreting a chemical that was perhaps retarding the growth of the bacteria? That insight led to the discovery of penicillin, which is potentially the most important uh, medicinal breakthrough in the last 100 years. In today's world, where you're three levels of bureaucracy away from the principal investigator when you're seeing these bottom-level observations, it's highly unlikely that a tech who accidentally let a plate out overnight, had it be infected, is going to hand it up through the chains of management, and the entire company is going to pivot its decision-making around that. We're divided from that. OK, but it's not just the function that's been slowed. It's also the cycle, as Eric mentioned. So it used to be that at the beginning of the week, you could sit down and design your experiments. Throughout the week, you could conduct your experiment. And by the weekend, you'd have some data to come back and analyze so that you could make decisions on the next experiment to run. These days, it's gotten a lot more complicated. First, you need to acquire the equipment you need to get started. As I mentioned before, the costs are pretty astronomically high. So when we ask people whether or not they have equipment aspects problems, over 80% of them said, yes, indeed, they do. Scarier still, the way to get around this is usually to beg, borrow, and steal from your friends as the most common workaround was indeed personal favor from other scientists when you can't move forward. This is not a very well-served market. If you do manage to acquire the equipment, the next step is to onboard the experiments, get them all up and running for the very first time. That takes, on average, about a month per experiment. And for a given research initiative, you need somewhere between a dozen or half a dozen experiments to get set up. So that means you're looking at six months to a year if you're starting from scratch just to get started to do your basic research. And that, by the way, is when things go smoothly. When things don't go smoothly, you hit a bad troubleshooting. And we ask carefully about what bad troubleshooting looks like. It's even worse. Occasionally, about a third of the time, there's this pit right here, where things can take from six months to a year to get working again. To try to express this frustration to people not inside the field, imagine if you were a software developer, uh, and your network went down, and your administrator came to you and said, we expect it to be back by this time next year. <laughs> Makes it very hard to make progress when you're dealing with cycles like this. Even then, once you get all the way through the uh, cycle and you manage to get your data, you spend most of your time at the bench. The most time-consuming activity by far for scientists is, in fact, conducting the experiments at the bench, mixing liquids, doing these sort of things. This is all kind of slowing the pace of innovation in a very big way. All right, so less doom and gloom. What can we do to reimagine this a little bit? Well, we have to think more carefully about process. We have to think about what it is that's leading to the rate of this change. We can't just think about uh, the current drug that we're working on and how we're going to be most effective in that particular example. We have to think about how we're working on the drugs in general if we're going to move things forward. And two obvious things that came to mind to us when we thought deeply about this that we needed to fix were that first we needed to do something about the barriers to entry. We needed to lower them. One way to do that immediately, and Silicon Valley knows real well, is find ways to amortize the fixed costs. So there's no reason everyone should be building $10 million labs to get started if not all of them are actualizing the value of that. 
In addition, we need to democratize the access to them so you don't have to be a tenure professor at Harvard in order to run groundbreaking experiments. This is kind of a sadly negative feedback situation because as the research gets more and more expensive and it takes more and more money to get started, we've been more and more conservative about what we're willing to put forward. That, of course, means that we're less and less likely to get radically disruptive change. We need to invite in outsiders if we're going to allow this to happen. Such barriers to entry as we could fix, though, it's also this cycle. And to iterate faster, the things we have to be thinking about are, first of all, minimizing that experiment onboarding time, best case scenario, eliminating it completely. No reason to reinvent the wheel once someone's got a Western blot working in one lab if we find a way to package that up and get that working in other labs as well. And we need to uh, mitigate and avoid those pitfalls that can make or break companies and can make or break PhD theses um, by getting, them out, getting out in front of them and making sure that they don't block the development timeline. All this is really focused essentially on process itself. And this is something we don't do terribly well in the biotech industry. There's a great quote um, from Andy Grove of Intel fame, who was actually talking about the failures of biotech to iterate at its bottom level, where he said, I think we should look conscientiously, with great dedication, for those things that made Moore's Law work. God didn't give us Moore's Law. Even Gordon Moore didn't give us Moore's Law. Your predecessors in the lab worked hard for it. And what he's saying there is that you can't simply apply best practices to each drug development and expect this trend to reverse. We need radical and disruptive innovation in this process, or we have a serious problem. Perhaps not that serious, but very serious. Essentially, this resource that is uh, customer spending is not unlimited. Right now, we spend about $8,000 a year on healthcare individually, and that can double maybe one or two more times before we have a very serious problem. Something has to be done to reverse this trend if we're going to move forward. OK, so enough alarmists. Let's talk about what we're doing at Emerald to reverse this trend. And we thought very deeply about this idea of process and what we could do to fix it. And what we did is we took a look back at this chart again, and we said, what here is absolutely necessary for us to move forward? Well, the data is necessary. We can't live without it. The data is, in fact, the science itself at the end of the day. Can't get rid of that. The machines that produce the data are already designed to be minimal. Uh, they don't have 100 buttons they never push. They have 100 buttons, and we push almost all of them. <laughs> So we need them there. But this bureaucracy of three levels of management, perhaps not altogether necessary. And what we wanted to do was pioneer a more radical approach to this that would get rid of that level. What we did is invent something we call a symbolic laboratory. This is very different how most research institutions conduct their research. The way we do this is that we have an investigator. And that investigator, rather than working with a team of scientists, talks only to a server providing with exact experiment experimental details how they want their experiments carried out. Every day, then, we have a team of operators who come in, pull off the server the experiments that need to get done, and then are cross-trained with highly automated equipment to run the experiments. This keeps them from specializing in any one particular experiment, and it keeps them from providing additional information that's not provided originally by the investigator in the server. We think very carefully about how to compartmentalize that information. That then generates a bunch of data which gets dumped back on the server and then handed back to the investigator. So, of course, the investigator needs a series of software tools to deal with the fact that they're handling much more data than they're used to. So the way we did this and, and implemented this in practice is we had to create an actual hardware descriptive language to describe the experiments themselves. We call this the symbolic lab language. Essentially, it is code which describes how the experiments get carried out in full vivid detail. Usually, this involves some kind of uh, robotic encapsulation of the experiments. Sometimes, though, there are human components of them that are carefully vetted with checklists so that we're sure they're getting reproduced the same way every time. In general, this provided three huge advantages for us. First of all, it directly connected the investigator to the data. The devil could run, but it could not hide in the details. Second, it provides a virtuous cycle for the operators. The operators are now very focused on finding ways to reduce cost, to up automation, and to make everything move more smoothly. Without the distraction, of, oh my god, I need this drug to move forward as fast as possible. They're focused on the experiments themselves. And finally, most importantly, this allows us to compoundly grow. Every time we solve a problem, we solve it permanently in code. It exists for the next generation, and when we want to reproduce an experiment, we press go again. That's something that's completely unique in this field, and we think at the base level would at least provide us a hope of making some kind of dent in that negative exponential trend. <laughs>
Thanks.